Hey friends, how are you? We hope you're doing really well. We wanted to join you today and bring some special guests along because we have a really important topic to discuss with you and that would be back to school because a lot of you have a lot of questions, concerns, and so we brought in the experts and then we also brought in a couple of moms um, that you know have questions just like all of you do, uh, moms and dads alike. So let's start at the top. Ami, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Ami Zabrowski. I'm the Director of Student Services for the School District of La Crosse. So in my role, I oversee special education, our counselors, our social workers, our nurses, and school psychologists. Excellent. Dr. Engel. Hello, I'm Dr. Aaron Engel. I'm the superintendent of the School District of La Crosse. Um, I started on July 1st, so uh, I'm excited to be a part of the community and a part of the school district. Excellent. Ann? Ann Wonderly and I have a high schooler and a middle schooler in the La Crosse School District. And Amy. I'm Amy Hetlevig. I'm a full-time real estate agent in La Crosse and I have three kiddos. One's out of school, but um, otherwise a sixth grader and a fifth grader in La Crosse School District. Excellent. So obviously today we wanted to um, talk about a few things um, with the experts and then also allow you as our listeners and friends to ask questions that you may have um, concerning back to school. So we thought we would cover a few things, um, starting right out the gate. I think one of the big questions that a lot of people have, and maybe Dr. Engel, you might be able to ask, answer this question. How did the process of the decision making you know, happen when it came to virtual learning starting September 1st? So we've been working with the County Health Department to understand the public health risk in the community for, for months now. Um, they've been uh, a very valuable partner in understanding um, how COVID-19 uh, affects people and affects our, our schools. And, uh, you know, they're the public health experts. Yeah, we consider ourselves hopefully experts in education. However, you know, we don't have all the knowledge about public health. And so we've really been relying on them to help us understand the risks to our students and our staff um, as we think about reopening our school buildings. So that, that, uh, that uh, process has been ongoing. Uh, we've been, we worked with the, the county compass to, to understand, you know, some of those guidelines uh, as, we, as we move forward. And uh, using that information from the public health department, we uh, looked at you know, what's gonna happen on September 1st? Where is our community gonna be? What is the risk going to be to our students? And the, the, the reality is we don't know, right? We, we don't know if things are gonna change for the better. We don't know if things are gonna change for the worse. Uh, we do know that in the meantime, our, our universities are gonna reopen, our, our tech schools are gonna reopen. There's gonna be a lot more folks in town. And so thinking about that uncertainty, not knowing where things are gonna be, we wanted to provide as much certainty for our families as we could, and also for our teaching staff so they could prepare for the best possible start to the school year. And the one option that we knew we would be able to pursue no matter what is a virtual start. So if the conditions are, are really bad, come the start of September and we're forced to start virtually, you know, we know that we can start in that way. And so that's the, the path that we've chosen for the start of the school year. And we invite those of you watching on Facebook to ask questions as well, but how will reassessment go as we go forward? Because obviously things are changing by the minute. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, while we've committed to a virtual start, we also know that for most of our students, in-person learning is the best possible place. And as I think about our early elementary students, um, you know, it's going to be really difficult to, to provide the best possible education while we're virtual. And and even for middle school students and high school students, we know that engagement in the spring wasn't where we wanted it to be. It was, it was very difficult for a lot of students to access that online education. And so as soon as we can get back to in-person education, you know, we intend to do so. And so we're gonna to continue to work with the county to, to monitor uh, the conditions. And uh, as soon as we have metrics that show that it's safe for us to return to in-person learning, we will do that. I, I would like to say that while we weren't I don't think anyone was, you know, entirely happy with how the end of last school year went. However, you know, we've had months to learn and plan, and we have uh, uh, lots of things in place to ensure that we're really focused on high quality instruction this upcoming uh, fall, even if we are virtual. 
Anne or Amy, do you guys have any questions about, you know, kind of that part of things, how decisions were made or anything like that? My I, comment, oh, go ahead, Amy. No, no, you're good, you're good. Okay. I have a lot of comments, so I'll oh. talk to later. <laughs> uh, I, I, um, I have a lot of respect for the decision making. I, I cannot imagine having that responsibility because I am 100% um, wanting my children in in-person schooling, but I respect that it's what I want, not maybe what's best. So um, I don't envy the position you're in. I think communication is key. Um, I just this week got my son's what the high school day will look like. Um, don't have the middle school one yet. And I think once we get those, it, as a parent, you can figure out, you know, we have, we work full time, um, run businesses. It's extremely busy and stressful. Amy, it sounds like you're really busy too. Um, to know, you know, how the day's gonna be is huge. So that made me kind of be able to discuss with my high schooler, okay, here's what your schedule, we don't know what classes yet, but at least what your day will look like. Um, you know, we were, we are fortunate we were, had an uh, uh, IT company out at our house this week because our internet is shoddy and um, had the ability to, you know, hire someone to come in to make sure it works. I worry about kids that I know the school district is doing things, but I mean, we've got good stuff and it's still not that great out at our house. So. Um, you know, those are the factors that I know families are even more stressed about than we were. Um, do you have an idea? I know September, okay, I can wrap my head around 30 days. We have to figure out how to keep our boys motivated, how to help them after working full time, all of that. Do you have kind of a guideline or an idea for us to know, okay, by September 15th, we'll know what October is going to be like or how, um, in your mind, how do you see that? I know there's no definites, but in your mind, how do you see that going forward? Because it is hard as families to plan childcare and motivation and to come home after working and still be a pleasant mom to help with the schoolwork that they didn't understand and that type of thing. Absolutely. Uh, we are very understanding of the fact that a virtual start places a huge burden on families. Uh, and it's not something that we would choose willingly if we didn't feel like we had to. Um, Initially, when we had, you know, kind of some more explicit guidance with the, the county compass, you know, our initial plan was to reassess in mid-September and with that information, start trying to plan for uh, the start of October. Um, I think that, you know, this reassessment that the county is undergoing as far as what metrics they're going to use, you know, it's going to lead us to start reassessing maybe sooner. You know, uh, we know that in-person instruction is best for kids. And so, you know, as soon as we can get students back in, we would like to do so. The only thing I'm a little nervous about though is we don't want parents to undergo this like yo-yo effect where we're in school this week and we're out of school next week. And I feel like while that will be a benefit for that one week, the students in school, you know, I'm nervous about the impact that will have on parents, you know, constantly reacting to that uncertainty and trying to figure things out on a, on a week to week basis. And so, I want kids in school as soon as possible. At the same time, I want to provide some consistency, um, you know, for parents so that they can plan ahead. You know, like you, you talked about, you know, internet and communication, you know, those are important things. And so we, we can't, you know, be changing directions, you know, you know, every other day. Parents need some consistency and understanding to plan their lives, to get things in order. And the same actually goes, is true for schools as well. Like we have to set up transportation routes and get school lunches ready. And that requires ordering and planning. And, you know, it, we don't want to say that we're coming back to school, you know, two days later and we can't get a bus to that student's house or we don't have food for them at lunch, you know. So our, our plans probably can't change on a week to week basis for all of those reasons, you know, but, you know, we want to be very responsive to the conditions in the community and get kids in school for as long and as much as possible. Amy, do you have, what did you have? Yeah, well, echoing what Ann said too, a, a lot of, a lot of the similar things. I mean, you're in an impossible situation, right? <laughs> the school district is. I, none of us have done this before. Um, we don't know. We just don't know what we don't know, right? So um, thank you for making hard decisions that none of us really know what the right decision is. Um, and hindsight's always twenty twenty. So I'm sure we'll get on the other side of this and go, oh, we could have done that better. We could have done this better. But um, one thing that 
and this isn't a gripe, it's more of a question. Um, I, I've noticed in talking to some of my mom friends, like in different districts like Holman and on Alaska, um, they've, already, it, they've already gotten like their school pictures done, they already know what their school day is gonna look like, and you mentioned your high schooler knows what the day is gonna look like kind of, but middle school and elementary school don't. Um, is it because La Crosse District is so much larger than those other districts that we're not getting that information right away? Or it just seems like they're a little bit more ahead than we are. And I feel like my anxiety might go down a little bit if I mm -hmm. kind of knew, yeah. you know, what was going on. So that's just a question I have. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think one element of it is that, you know, we are a much larger school district than Onalaska or Holman. Um, you know, the school district I just came from, Gail Edrick Trumpelow, where I was a superintendent for five years, you know, my student, my, my children have known, or children in that school district have known a lot more for a lot longer, you know, and um, the conditions are a little bit different there, you know, the size of the organization is much different, you know, we've got, you know, nine elementary schools, we've got three middle schools, and we have a number of charter schools, getting all of those unique considerations um, together, getting all those principles involved. You know, we wanna make sure that all of the families that we have uh, have the information that they need, but we're just a more diverse organization. We, we're a lot bigger. And I think that definitely plays a role. I think some of the ways that we've done business in La Crosse are a little bit different than, West, than, than those other school districts have as well. You know, so things that might've happened sooner there naturally happen later here naturally. And so things like pictures or or uh, schedules, they wouldn't have come out. They wouldn't have come out until later, regardless in, in our school district. But I, I do think that you know, as a smaller organization, they can be a little bit more nimble. They can uh, make some decisions a little more quickly. You know, our uh, the school district of La Crosse is, is a more diverse community. You know, we have a wider range of uh, ethnicities, uh, of socioeconomic uh, conditions, and so I think some of those considerations you know, take a little bit longer to ensure that, you know, we're taking care of all of our families. And the last thing we want is bad information out to folks. You know, we want to make sure that people are getting the right information, the right time. We don't want to, we don't want to add to that confusion to families, you know? And so uh, I think in our case, you know, we've taken maybe a couple extra days to, to get that information together, but it'll lead to accurate information the first time. So do you have an estimated time, Dr. Engel, when that information would be available for the younger kids? Uh, it should be coming out any day, any day now. I know our, our principals have been working, you know, tirelessly on that information. Uh, I don't have an exact date, but, um, you know, it's coming out very soon. Uh, so I, I did get an email from our middle school, I think it was yesterday, saying they'd have it to us next week. So even okay. just those bits of communication help mm -hmm. with, Dr. Engel, what you're talking about, the yo-yo. I think every parent has felt like they've been on a yo-yo since March. So has everybody. I mean, it's not, sure. you know, but I think truly once I got that schedule, I could just be like, at least I know what my high schoolers day, which right. it did kind of surprise me what it was going to be like, but I was like, holy cats. Okay. Good thing we've got the internet fixed because they're on from eight to one thirty every day. Um, but it's doable. You can wrap your mind around it. You can, you know, motivate your child and figure out a plan and set expectations. And so I did get an email from our middle school principal yesterday saying that we would get it next week. So I'm like, okay, then I've got a little while to wrap my head around that. But um, I think that, I think the school has done a good job of communicating. I just think you can, all, not you, I'm saying in general, over communication, as you guys know, is better than under because the yo-yo is for real. <laughs> it's happening to all of us. Yeah, and I think the communication is, you know, that is something that we need to, to do as much as possible. And there's, there's probably lots of areas for improvement there. Um, the difficulty I think sometimes is, you know, we keep anticipating this next update, you know, like yeah. keep hearing like, hey, we're gonna find out more on Thursday. And then on Thursday they say, well, we're gonna know more on Tuesday. And then, right. you know, and, and that's no excuse, you know, for not communicating what we know. It's just really hard to send out that email that says, we just wanna let you know that we don't know anything new. You know, we're hoping that next week we'll get something. And then to keep saying that, you know, is it, it would be frustrating as a parent as well, I know also. And so, oh, yeah. yeah, I agree. We need, to, we need to do a better job of communicating as we move forward. And, and I think uh, we're getting things out rapidly now as we, move, as we move into the school year. So, Ami, this might be something that you can help with. So we know that we are starting back virtually September 1st in the La Crosse School District. Mm -hmm. So that's happening. So what are some things that we can do for our kids to maybe help them 
with that virtual learning process to maybe make it a little bit better or easier? I mean, this is difficult anyway, but do you have any insight for us? Do you have any you know, tips or tricks or anything like that to maybe help with that? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the first most important things is our kids look to us for how they approach things. So as parents, if we can um, show that we are in support of this start, it may be difficult to acknowledge that, but um, that we're in support and um, that this is a really unique way to connect with your teachers more so than you were in the spring, so that our students aren't creating anxiety that um, maybe is coming from us as parents, right? Because um, they, they look to us for how they're gonna respond to challenging situations. Um, and then I think it's really important as parents to, to listen to where they're at, to check in and see where their frustrations are, right. um, to um, allow them to voice those frustrations and um, help them find resources through the school. We have great counselors, social workers, school psychologists. Our teaching staff is wonderful and they're there for when challenges arise. Mm -hmm. um, if, and if students are feeling overwhelmed, we have thought through and have plans for how we can support kids if the virtual is becoming difficult. So don't be afraid to ask. Reach out to, I always say, reach out to the person you have a relationship with in the school first. Yeah. But if you don't, if you're unsure of who that is or who that is for your student, our, our counselors and social workers are incredible resources um, for that. That's what I was wondering, because, you know, there's a lot of kids that are, they're hands-on learners. And yeah. so it, it might be really difficult. So I was kind of wondering, Will there be extra help if, if a kid does start falling behind and really start struggling? What can you do for that kid that would maybe help them to catch up? Because I'm sure that that's also a real issue with a lot of people right now worrying about their kid and where they are with the learning process because maybe at the end of last school year, they may have already started falling behind and then they just wanna make sure that they're getting what they need. You know. Yeah. So just like in face-to-face -face learning, our schools are really good at um, keeping tabs on where students are and progressing. Okay. And so we've been making plans for how can we be monitoring student progress in a virtual setting so that we're very responsive to that. Um, sure. And then on the side, I know there's lots of questions around students that have specialized services and um, we're vigorously making plans for how to make sure that those students that have those specialized services continue those um, virtually or in some unique situation situations, particularly with students with IEPs, potentially um, having some limited face-to-face -face contact if virtually is absolutely not um, uh, doable for a student. Somebody on Facebook asked the question, how can we have kids do online schooling when they can't read? I'm assuming that would be a younger child. Um, so I guess, what do you have to say about that question in particular? Yeah, um, students come to school for uh, you know lots of different reasons, and reading is obviously a, a primary one, particularly at the early grades. However, a lot of what um, students do isn't you know just based in reading. It might you know, at the younger grades be play-based learning. You know, in kindergarten, you know, uh, playing with toys, um, talking with uh, an adult or another child, and obviously that is made more difficult you know by a virtual start. But there are activities that kids can be doing and they can learn in their natural environment. You know, there's every day children are learning, you know, and whether it's helping wash the dishes or if it's picking up, you know, after a sibling or, you know, if they're watching PBS and, and learning about something through that, you know, there's any number of ways that students are able to learn without, uh, without reading. You know, I could see teachers, you know, providing activities to walk around your house and, and count the number of trees or, to go pick up two different types of leaves and compare and contrast them, you know, think about the differences there. So um, I know that our teachers are incredibly creative. Uh, they have been thinking about this nonstop since March and that the activities and, and uh, learning that they're gonna provide for students that aren't reading yet uh, will still be valuable and, and incredibly beneficial for them. And maybe it's not the traditional curriculum, but it's still learning and it's still important. And there's lots of things that they'll be able to bring with them when we do come back to school that teachers will build on to, to continue to advance their learning. And I don't know about you guys, but I've been thinking about that too. Like when you do go back to school, what will that look like? And is that determined 
now or is that determined just when we get there and you know i mean how how does that how does that all work um we've been thinking about that since the day we shut down you know we thought that you know in march 18th we thought we'd be closed for two weeks we thought we'd be coming back and we knew that when we came back there would be lots of safety procedures we would need to put in place to ensure that staff and students were safe and i can let uh, Ami, talk about some of the things that we've been thinking about in terms of keeping kids safe at school. Yeah, um, Dr. Engel's exactly right. Um, we have been thinking about how to open school safely for students um, uh, since March and April. Um, we are incredibly lucky to have a team of very well-educated and um, thoughtful nurses in our district that we've been consulting with on a regular basis um, for all the health and safety measures. So um, what you see in terms of what is best for us all out in the communities is a lot what we're gonna see in our schools, um, making sure that we're promoting um, distancing as much as possible while recognizing that kids are kids and they're not gonna be able to to always, you know, maintain six foot distancing. Um, we will see masks um, by teachers and students in the schools. Um, we, one of the most important things we can do is to keep um, our kids in cohorts as much as possible um, so that they're only having contact or close contact with a, a select group of sta staff and students. Um, that helps us limit the potential exposure point but it also helps us with um, contact tracing if we do have positive cases. Yeah. Um, but I, I would expect to, even though we have all these safety precautions and school is going to look really different for students, um, I, we have really good teachers that um, understand child development and they understand how to help kids feel safe and feel like they belong and feel like they're cared for. Um, and so a lot of what our initial um, work is going to be when kids come back to school is talking to them about how all these things are different and why we're doing them and that we're doing this all to take care of each other. Yeah, because um, they come back to school and they're like, I see my friend, I want to go and hug them. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, I don't know, like, it's just, it's so like, you think about that and you're like, oh gosh, you know, I, I don't know how that's going to work or what that's going to look like. I don't know. And yeah. one of the things that's been on my mind that I've discussed with people too, is when we do go back and it's, you know, we try to isolate the kids in a certain group, it would almost, I mean, that's going to be logistics, holy some moats, but um, almost would have to be by neighborhood or something because my son plays with, I mean, the kids have played together outside every day. So if you don't keep them together, it's cross-contaminating anyway. So that's going to be, you know, you got the families, then you've got the neighborhoods, but you still want to integrate different kids. But yet, if the whole point is to keep them away, you know, in their own group, you have, you just got to consider who they're possibly most likely with when they're not at school. Otherwise, it defeats the whole purpose, which is I just can't imagine. I mean, you guys don't know who, what kids hang out with who and how that works, but that's yeah. just um, a logistical nightmare, I would imagine. Yeah, I, I, it is. Um, and I think, you know, within the schools, we can control what we control, can control, which is what happens during the school day. But we can also help communicate and educate our community as well. And so, you know, uh, our conversations with students about um, how to keep themselves safe and healthy, both in school and out, our communications with parents around that is important too. I mean, we all have to make decisions as, as parents on how to limit exposures outside of our places of work and our, our, um, our school for our daycare for our student our children so um, it but it is really tough I'll say it I mean and I, I get all of the um, I get the kids need that social piece I've got young children and it's one of the most challenging things um, for me right now is not having the social connections that I know my kids need. And then when we do have them, trying to explain to an almost four-year-old, um, you got to give space um, so that we can all stay healthy. Um, so those are tough conversations, and but our staff is here to help and have those with kids too, in terms of the school context. Um, and our, our staff is here to help you as parents too. 
Um, if you're unsure how to talk about things or to um, make decisions, we have counselors and social workers, we have our nurses that are happy to talk with families about what they know about um, health and limiting spread of disease. So reach out and use those resources. Yeah, I would imagine the mental health of these children is extremely important and top priority. I mean, that's, Absolutely. you know, and, and it's, it's difficult. This is a really hard situation and a lot of them don't understand, especially the younger kids. Um, so this is tough. A lot of people don't really know what to do. At, at least that's what I've been here. I'm not a parent, so I don't, I can't, you know, I've got a niece and a nephew though, and, and I can see what it has done to them. And, you know, their spirits have been different, you know, a little different. And, um, you know, you just, you just worry, you know, you want them to, to thrive and do well and, and be happy. And, but you also want them to be healthy. So it's, it's a tough, it's a tough thing. Absolutely. I would say one of the most important things, and we're currently working on at each building um, systems to do this, but as parents, if you are seeing significant changes in your child's um, behavior or their emotional well-being, communicate with us so that we can help you. Um, and we're going to we're gonna have efforts at each building to reach out to parents to get that information. But um, for anyone listening, um, if you're seeing that already, reach out to the principal, your school's teach your child's teacher, um, the counselor in the building, so that we can help support you. Because yes, mental health is number is huge priority right up there with health and safety. And we do have lots of plans for how our student services staff can support, how our teachers can support on a day-to-day -day basis in the classroom, and then working with our um, our colleagues in the community. Um, you know, we there are options where we can help support teletherapy services during the school day. Um, there are ways that we can connect families with resources beyond what the school um, can potentially provide. So we're here for you and, and the kids. That's really good to know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we had a couple of questions on Facebook. Uh, a couple, a, a lot of them we've, we've answered throughout this, um, but a few people are wondering when they'll find more info for the Cooley Region Virtual Academy, those that have, um, I, Am I correct that um, enrollment for the virtual academy is closed, correct? That is correct. Yeah. Enrollment is closed. There's information up on our, on our website about the Cooley Region Virtual Academy. I know people are looking more about specific enrollments. Um, we're still finalizing staffing for that right now. Um, you know, we're basically setting up a brand new school of a thousand students in, in three months. And so we wanted to make sure that we provided that online opportunity for families that had real concerns about coming back. At the same time, it has been a lot of uh, logistics and uh, we're getting to a point where I think we'll be able to communicate definitively about a lot of that information that parents are seeking. So it should be forthcoming. Awesome. Um, a quick question about that. Uh, about So I enrolled my kiddos in the CRVA and uh, we're actually kind of excited about it. I mean, as excited as we can be. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we're trying to embrace the change. But my question is, could you speak, I guess one of the biggest questions I hear consistently and I also have um, in my mom groups is, what is the difference between the learning platform of the face-to-face -face kiddos versus the, um, the Cooley Region Virtual Academy? So I think the face-to-face -face kiddos are using Canvas, is that right? And then um, the virtual academy is the name escapes me. I think it's Buzz, maybe. Buzz, yes. Thank you. And like I, when I saw that the little bit of information that was put out when we were making our decision what platform to go with, I had to look it up on YouTube. Okay, what does Buzz look like? Like, is there any way? And I know it's probably coming out anyway. I'm sure you guys will put it out. But could you give us a preview of what? the platforms look like that that would have been helpful which again i'm not griping i know you guys are doing the best you can but um oh, like, I, I appreciate that 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 is good information to know and we can certainly uh, get that out there sooner than later um you know the the difference between the two platforms is is you know i think visually probably different but you know they 
both function in, in the same way. And it, it's kind of like, um, you know, using different browsers or, you know, different apps on your phone, like different types of phones, you know, I think we've all become accustomed to kind of navigating, you know, the same basic things in different ways, you know, and so I think for our students, they'll have no trouble, you know, navigating Buzz or Canvas and the experience will be, you know, relatively similar. Um, when we set up the Cooley Region Virtual Academy, we're part of a, a larger network in the state that helps support that. And so the, the system that they use to support that is, is this Buzz system. And so that allows us access to um, courses across the state, you know, particularly for high school students that will hopefully be a real benefit. Um, so that, you know, forced our hand as far as a choice there with the Cooley Region Virtual Academy because it allows us access to so much more. Uh, locally, though, um, we chose Canvas as our uh, preferred system for our learning management system, and uh, we're excited about launching that for students uh, that are enrolled, uh, you know, face to face at some point here in our school district. And not to monopolize the conversation, but a quick piggyback off of that. So, Canvas, um, have the teachers been working with that now? I, I, are they getting trained in it? I, here's my gripe from spring, which I know it's not going to be like spring anymore, but. Um, we had like literally 20 different login usernames, like to all these different sites. It's not gonna be like that, right? It is not gonna be like that. Um, the, one of the, the key metrics that we were looking at as we chose the system was, can it do everything? You know, and you know, a learning management system can't do everything ultimately, but this one that we're choosing, and Buzz is good at this as well, will do a lot of those things so that you don't have to go to 20 different sites. You don't have to remember all these different logins. We want to lower the barrier to access as much as possible and choosing Canvas was a part of that decision. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks to all of you for being a part of this. Thanks to everyone who's watching on Facebook. Uh, if you missed the beginning, this will live on our Facebook page. We'll also get it on the Buzz blog on the Z93 Lacrosse app and at Z93.com. Um, what is the best way uh, for parents that have questions you know, tomorrow or on Monday Who's the best person for them to reach out to? Is it their individual school, their child's teacher? Yep, always reach out to your school first. You know, those are the, the best people. They know the most about your teacher, your student, uh, your particular situation. So reach out to your uh, administrative assistant at your building or your school principal. And uh, if they can't find the, if they don't have the answer themselves, they'll find it for you. So that is always the best place to go. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time today. And thank, thank you, both of you uh, and everyone in the district for doing so much. I know that this was nobody's plan. And so, especially you, Dr. Engel, you just started in July? Yeah, July 1st. Yep. I mean, what, what a fun place to come <laughs> into. Um, but yeah, we, you know, we all appreciate everything that you've been doing and uh, appreciate what you will be doing in the uh, foreseeable future. And Anne and Amy, thanks so much for taking your time and sharing your, your life and, and your questions with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank well, you. hope you all have a fantastic day. Thanks again.